Good morning and welcome. My name is David. Hi, everyone. Larry Gold has a particular introduction in mind for me to deliver to you. And I, and I have one also. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you mine first, and then I'm going to give you Larry's, and then I'm going to sit down. <clears throat> this event is great, and here's why. Biomedicine and science over the course of the last 100 or 200 years have accomplished a whole lot and earned a lot of respect and credibility over that time. But like sneaking out from underneath this behemoth of healthcare and medicine and science and technology is kind of a new century for healthcare. And all the conferences, all the medical conferences around the country and around the world where people stand at a podium and they put up images and, and these horrible screenshots from New England Journal articles where nothing's legible and it's all in eight point font and no one can read it. But we're all so important and proud of our research that we all nod and smile and go to the next conference. That's all 20th century stuff. Is this familiar to anyone or am I just talking? Yeah? Okay. So, so here's what's kind of sneaking out in front and why this conference is great. It started in 2010. <laughs> Healthcare is not about reductionism anymore. You're going to hear about reductionism. And healthcare is not about the expert, the white man who walks around with a leather bag and all the knowledge and some instruments. It's just not about that anymore. And guess what it's also not about? It's also not about getting the scans that you need, the radiation that you need, so that you can have the medicine that you need, so that you can have the surgery that you need. And you need it because there were studies done on 10,000 people. And we know, because those 10,000 people who aren't you taught us something, right? That's old. So today you're going to learn about how people communicate with one another in different ways, one to many. You're going to learn about how your tumor is actually your tumor. It's not someone else's tumor. There are lots of people from that big community that I was telling you about who are kind of merging over into this conference because of Larry. So let me tell you just, just two seconds about Larry. I love him. <laughs> if anyone here knows Larry, you probably love him too. He's, for, for someone who's so old, <laughs> he, he has a remarkably youthful vision. <laughs> and he's very generous, and he's really inclusive, and that's why all of you are in this room. And I'm really happy to be here, because this is one of my favorite events ever, and I love coming to Boulder and meeting Larry's family each year. That's my introduction. Uh, here's Larry's introduction. Let me just check my notes. No, okay. Here's Larry. Hi, um, and, and apparently there's some people in some other room now, which we'll talk about for a second. Um, so I gave myself 15 minutes. Yes. Uh, so that's all you can read up there. There's, we had more people sign up than ever. Uh, and, and, and many of you uh, are here for the first time. It has to be true, because the number was so big. And. Um, and we're going to run out of room, uh, so we have to think next year about where to do this. So I had a goal. My goal was to tell you where I thought we were for the last five years and where I think uh, we might be going, the evolution of this thing. 
uh, which was the title I gave you, a, a title which none of you understood, one to five, six to 10, was about the first five and then the second. Stupid. <coughs> Stupid, but mine. Um, and then tomorrow afternoon, we'll do real thank yous. There's one thank you in the book that is uh, from all of our hearts. Carissa, who's here, is actually on the inside of the back cover. So all of you who see her today, you should hug her a lot. She's doing the right job for her talents with kids who are really sick in Denver and their families, and so this is all a triumph for her. This is the thing I got in the mail from Alan Jacobson. You'll hear from him about him, the Gold Lab Symposium. So you'll see back here I said, maybe we'll do it in an airport joke. And so that's an idea that we'll do it in the Rome airport next year. And to show you how generous we are, we'll fly all of you there at our expense, okay? <laughs> Thank you. So I want to start with something incredibly sad um, that happened here in Boulder a couple of weeks ago. I and mean, This may be inappropriate, but I have to just share this with you. This year, Peter Johnson, who died a couple of weeks ago, these are pictures of Peter from his life. Um, and he died at a very young age with a wonderful wife and two wonderful young boys. And he had a heart attack and died at the age of 41. And he was a world-class skier and a lot of things. And he died. And Byron and I got to meet with Peter and Carrie um, uh, just two days before he died. We had a couple of hours with him. And then he died. So this conference is actually about that. This conference is about, that sucks. His friend Johnny Alamo is here, who spoke at the memorial service for Peter. And um, it's terrible. So our job in fixing healthcare is not just to make it cheaper and not to make it more accessible to everybody, all that stuff, but, but also to make it uh, easier to be compliant about your own health and to know more, all that stuff. And so for me this year, because it just happened a couple of weeks ago, this, this unbelievable thing uh, kind of set the tone for the way I'm feeling about things this year, okay? So when you see Johnny, who's another guy that needs a hug, so Johnny Alamo and Carissa Gold both get your hugs whenever you see them. Johnny will take them. Carissa will too, okay? So here's then the first five year thing in the beginning. And the, you can read on, over there on this, these things that we made that we had an idea. And the idea was uh, right and incomplete. And the idea was that we would talk about science and we would make it understandable because it's not so hard. It's all this vocabulary shit. But once you get through that, it's not so hard. Just logic 101, kind of. And I thought, naively that that would be um, all we'd have to do. We'd have a lot of omics talks. The first year we had a lot of omics talks. And the idea was we'd make it understandable and everybody would say, yay omics. And that would be the beginning and the end and the final status of personalized medicine. That was the idea. <clears throat> that was my idea anyway. And you, some of you came from the first time and, and we talked about it's so simple, it's just DNA. That's a picture of DNA, kind of. Um, and then we, we talked last, that first year, we talked about the parts list of the central dogma, those little chromosomes that you see on the upper left. They got DNA in them. DNA is, when people study DNA, it's called genomics. DNA gets turned into RNA. I'm doing this so John Rain doesn't have to. Because last night he said he didn't want to do this. Um, then you make RNA, then you make protein, and so there's all these omixes. And, and, and somehow, um, if we understood all that stuff, the idea is that we would make better medicine, better health care. That was my idea then. And right up until last year during the symposium, I realized uh, that I continued to have that idea, but I changed during the symposium last year. And this slide was 
previous slide from number one about what we mean by personalized medicine. And it's, everybody has their own definition of personalized medicine, and most of them are stupid. This is no less stupid than any of them, I, I should say. <laughs> and once you've seen one, you've seen them all. And the idea is kind of simple. We figured out you. you know, personalized medicine, as Ed Brody always said, has existed since there were doctors, right? When your doctor talks to you, it's personal. Even though they only talk to you for 11 seconds these days, uh, it's still a very personal 11 seconds. And so, um, so the idea is, can you, my idea from the beginning was let's turn that personalized medicine into something that is also called evidence-based medicine and measure a lot of omics stuff and use the omics stuff to inform the patient about whatever it is. So here's a, a wonderful thing from a, a guy that many of you in the audience know. Mark Levin is a famous biotech wizard and now a big investor in lots and lots of startup companies. And the quote is from an article that Byron showed me the other day uh, from some personalized, personalized medicine coalition or something. And the first thing in the quotation marks is kind of the idea that was my thought that if we could just measure all this stuff and correlate it with outcomes, um, then we could turn that into action for people and that'd be great. And as it says in the bottom of the slide, that was my goal, just share all of this with you, bring you all up to whatever the necessary level is as citizens, as it used to say over there, but well, now it says it over here. And um, that was a good idea. And in, in the, hope, the whole hope I had was that this would lead ultimately, evidence-based medicine, personalized medicine, would lead to what you might call screening. You'd go blood tests, and the blood tests would tell you you're okay. And so Melogic, Barnes, and my, our company here in town is about that. And so it's a good idea, you would think. But then there is, are the naysayers. So I just read this in the last week by this guy from Stanford. And, and the article is an entire long, serious article about how none of it works. Oops, screening, right? So a lot of you have had your PSA done. That's an example of a not terribly effective screening. And, and look at the quote from, I, took, I, I quoted it right from the paper. It says it doesn't work. And, 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 and it barely works for the diseases it's supposed to work for. And when you save men my age from prostate cancer, they still died about the same time. You know, kind of 73 and a half. Well, good news, you didn't die with, with prostate cancer, you died with some other stupid thing. So, <laughs> so it, it's, it's kind of terrifying that we're all working toward this idea that evidence will help us take the right actions. But this article by, uh, by Ioannidis is, uh, is a little scary. And, and I've thought about this a lot. And I thought about our task here. And I decided that Ioannidis is wrong, that what's wrong with screening historically, even though some of it works a little, this is from his paper also, is that the screening is bad. That is, we don't do good screening. We don't know how to do good screening. But if we got to that point, you might still have some hope that you could do that curve I've shown every year but won't show this year about keeping the quality of your life high and then plunge instead of this piddle down to some ignominious death. <clears throat> so um, so I think it, it, it's coming to a, a time. So. So let's assume that the technical stuff is going to be OK. Everybody's working on it. You know, nobody's giving up yet just because <clears throat> Ioannidis uh, tells us that the history is bad. So we decided that we would make uh, this thing about something. We've been talking about it forever. So I want to show you this, the last few slides, and then we'll be done, about <clears throat> a moment of truth. Uh, this says we got serious about what we might do here. This was actually driven, started with Carissa, who 
made Zoe and Janet, who wasn't in this picture and not in this, at this meeting, and Meredith, we all talked about what we could do. <clears throat> and then we decided we better have a meeting with uh, people who understand that in this audience there might be people, and through this effort we might be able to do something. I'll show you what we're going to try in a minute. And this is, so we had a meeting in Boston, and you can see Bob Duke laughing at, I probably used the F word, which I'm not going to do now, and he, th he still thinks the F word is funny because he's a child, as you all know. <laughs> And there's Ken Sharp kind of gesticulating. There's Evelyn and Brush and, and, uh, and my good friend Larry. Larry. And there's uh, Alan Jacobson, who we're going to embarrass tomorrow. Uh, when he's the moderator, he's going to be embarrassed, along with Scott Danielson. And we talked about what we might do. And we actually have an idea, finally. <clears throat> and I'll show you that. What we did is we decided that sociology and human behavior were important for healthcare. That's what it says at the top of the slide. And, um, and it's a, this is a, a wonderful slide to me. It doesn't actually have anything, any relevance to anything that we're talking about, but it doesn't worry me at all. And we, you know, so we got to get, we have to behavior change in some form that lets healthcare do what it might do best. And behavior is hard to modify. This is my favorite behavior modification slide from the New Yorker. Tell me if you love that slide. My New Year's resolution is to lose 38,000 pounds. <laughs> OK, you, got, you have to have a goal. <laughs> That's a goal. And some of you know that at Somalaji, we're trying to be part of the solution. So there's a slide here, not meant to, not shameless advertising. The idea is you could measure stuff. We happen to measure one of the omics things. And we think if you do that, and you think hard about patients and their outcomes and their health status, you might be able to, uh, to make a difference. And we've done some small amount of clinical trials related to this quote from Mark Levin. What happens if we could take a sample of blood sequence, blah, 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 <coughs> measure the proteins, and look at it every year? That's a good idea. There are very few examples of that uh, so far in the world. And here's an example, an end, this end of one thing. This is an example of, of, of some person, who doesn't, doesn't matter who it was, whose proteins were measured every month for five years. And some things went up, some things went down. And there's correlations for much of this with the medical record of this person. And so you can begin to think, huh, this could, could work if the data were of high quality and if the, the number of people that you inadvertently sent to the hospital when they were healthy, the so-called false positives, that's a big problem. So we're going to have to worry about that. But worrying about that is better than not trying at all, at all, OK? So as a result of the Boston summit, to glorify a lot of drinking and eating, um, <clears throat> we've made a decision to spend time now with this foundation to go after uh, an improved Colorado uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. So we think that we know the pieces of um, what it would take to make Colorado an experiment. So I'm an experimental scientist still, so maybe we could do that. We could get into our activist behavior, but instead of trying to stop something a long way away, maybe we could do this thing in Colorado, which is only 1% of the population, and I think that that is worth a try. So we're going to try that this year. And we've set up a bunch of meetings and all that kind of stuff to make this happen. We have ideas. And we actually want you to join us, you collectively, individually, in some form. <clears throat> because this is going to take, as Ken Sharp said last year when he was talking about palliative care, remember how striking it was that it took 35 years to get to where we are today. The most remarkably depressing thing of last year's symposium, and also the most powerful, was that this very good thing 
had taken decades to, to happen. So this is not gonna happen in two and a half minutes, okay? So that's what I'd like you to think about, along with a few other things. During these two days, um, you can, you can, we're all open to making this meeting better, that'd be fine. Uh, I want you to keep agreeing with me that Mark Levin is right. If you measure a bunch of stuff, you can do good things. I think that's a good, I think he's right. He's right. I hope he's right. And that this guy from Stanford is too pessimistic. If you read his paper, you would never see a doctor again. You would just play, <laughs> you would just not go. You read this paper, you think, huh. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I think he's wrong. And so we're gonna build some sort of a consortium between this little foundation and the Colorado <clears throat> Big Shots. And you could join us, not only here for the weekend, but you can let us know by email. Yeah, look, come sign me up and we'll have meetings and we'll talk and we'll start that 35 year thing uh, after we take a week off after the symposium. <laughs> so, so that's the plan. So I hope this is a lot of fun today. I, I'm expecting it to be. I've not failed. I have always enjoyed these things. And I'm excited, like you. And, and clearly, I have no idea what's coming. But just to be clear, I, know, I probably know what John Wren and Anna Pyle are going to talk about only. So that's two for 20. There will be stand-up comedy um, from our inveterate uh, old guys, they're gonna come and make us giggle. I think this year we will not hear the towel joke, which would be a tremendous disappointment to not hear the towel joke for the third year in a row. So thank you, okay, let's get going.